In the last sketch, we covered atherosclerotic disease of the aorta and its primary branches. Let's expand our horizons a bit and take a look at more distal branches of the arterial tree. Blockages can occur way out here too, leading to some classic signs and symptoms that should be immediately recognizable on exam. Now, I gotta warn you, it's gonna get dirty. And yellow gunky stuff is going to fill all your crevices by the time we're done. Every crotch and cranny. But that's what you signed up for, isn't it? I mean, why just exercise? When you can get exercise while avoiding electric shock, trudging through ice baths, and wading in pools of muddy water most likely rife with Campylobacter. Welcome to the toughest mud run on the planet, the mud pad. Peripheral arterial disease, or PAD, is technically defined as atherosclerosis of the non-cardiac vessels, including the distal aorta, which we tried to recreate here. That tunnel way in the back is the end of the abdominal aorta, which then branches between the common iliac arteries, before turning into the internal and external iliac arteries in the foreground. In any case, PAD affects over 200 million people around the world, especially in less developed regions in Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific. In the U.S., PAD is more common in African Americans than Caucasians, and risk increases proportionally with age. PAD can range from an annoying pain in the leg to such severe damage that amputation is the only recourse. Or you could just tape it up and get back in there! <laughs> what is this, your first time hurting yourself on purpose in the name of badassery? <laughs> Amateur. PAD is important to recognize because it's often associated with significant atherosclerosis elsewhere, such as the coronary, carotid, or cerebral vessels. The number one risk factor for PAD by far is smoking. Not tobacco use in general, but smoking only. Other forms of tobacco use don't seem to increase the risk of PAD anywhere near that of smoking. In fact, smoking is so significant that the Framingham Heart Study concluded peripheral artery disease was directly related to the number of cigarettes smoked in a lifetime. Even more, there's a 1.4-fold increase in PAD risk for every 10 cigarettes smoked per day. That's half a pack per day. PAD is a form of atherosclerosis, and, as such, the same factors that affect atherosclerosis will also affect PAD. Hypertension, for example, even with all other things being equal, doubles the risk for PAD. Similarly, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, renal disease, metabolic syndrome, homocystinemia, and family history are all important risk factors for PAD. These are all illustrated in our atherosclerosis sketch, so make sure to check it out for a more in-depth look. The pathophysiology of peripheral artery disease is identical to that of atherosclerosis of the coronary or cerebral arteries. Specifically, we're talking about microvascular injuries leading to endothelial damage, lipid aggregation, inflammation, and fibrous cap formation. While peripheral arterial disease can technically affect any peripheral artery, the vast majority of cases occur in the lower extremities, in the distal aorta, iliac, femoral, tibial, and fibular arteries. And out of all of these areas, the number one location of atheromas is the superficial femoral artery, which we've illustrated to the left. See that band of metal clamped over our external iliac tunnel? Once the external iliac passes underneath the inguinal ligament, it's officially called the femoral artery. And popping out of the distal femoral is a participant representing the next branch, the superficial femoral. I mean, I don't want to call him superficial, but look at that well-coiffed hair. This is a mud run, son. You're doing it wrong. Lesions in these peripheral arteries may be isolated to one particular vessel, but are more commonly diffuse and bilateral, with multiple vessels and areas affected. Since the peripheral arteries supply specific areas of the body, the location of the underlying atherosclerotic lesion can often be pinpointed by the patient's clinical presentation. The absolute most common presentation of PAD is intermittent claudication, otherwise known as ischemic pain, of the affected extremity. At Sketchy, claudication is symbolized by ischemic dirt clods, an expected side effect of mud running, of course. Claudication has a pathognomonic pattern, it occurs in a very specific area, in the distribution of the affected vessel, in other words. It's reproducible with exertion, most commonly walking, and quickly goes away with rest, so make sure to hit the rest station to gather your strength. 
Any smoker with lower extremity pain after walking that's quickly relieved with rest has PAD until proven otherwise. A common rule of thumb in PAD is that symptoms usually occur one segment below the location of the causative lesion. Since a narrowing or blockage of an artery will only decrease blood flow downstream of the lesion. For example, the most common lesion in PAD occurs in the superficial femoral artery and typically causes calf claudication, which is why calf lady over here is next to our superficial femoral tunnel. Pain in the thighs or buttocks, like that being felt by reverse belay rope guy, or what is this guy doing exactly? Uh, wait, that rope is a bit, uh, suspiciously floppy. Both buttock pain and erectile dysfunction usually mean a blockage higher up, anywhere in the internal iliac and above, which is why we've placed him next to the internal iliac tunnel. As you've probably already noticed, one big difference between atherosclerotic disease in the central vessels and peripheral arterial disease is the actual presence of physical exam findings. Coronary and aortic atherosclerosis usually don't cause any visible changes. Often, the presenting symptom of coronary artery disease is just sudden death. However, since PAD involves the distal arterial branches, visible changes in the tissues will manifest that can pretend the severity of disease and things to come. Let's go over a few of the common ones now. First, and not surprisingly, reduced blood flow to the extremities causes them to be cool to the touch. Second, deficient blood flow to the hair follicles can lead to partial or complete loss of hair. Since the skin is the most distal organ perfused by the peripheral arteries, it's uniquely prone to ischemia. As a result, arterial ulcers are one of the toughest sequelae of PAD to treat. Ischemic skin ulcers often form on the lateral ankle or pressure points, such as the heel or where ill-fitting shoes rub. And on this dude, we've placed the ulcer on the lateral ankle area of his shoe, all the way through. These lesions usually have a punched-out look with well-defined margins and often extend deeply, sometimes all the way to the underlying muscle or bone. Since the area is deficient of blood flow, the lesions usually don't bleed or show any signs of granulation tissue, which would indicate a normal healing process. There can also be acute limb-threatening ischemia in PAD. Acute limb ischemia can either occur as a result of proximal atherothrombotic plaques breaking off and getting lodged in a smaller artery downstream depicted by these embolic ice cubes being scattered around, or from rupture and thrombosis of an atheroma that was originally located right inside the affected artery, hence the ruptured thrombotic hay bale obstacle in the foreground. Acute limb ischemia can be devastating, requiring amputation of the gangrenous limb if the symptoms last long enough. Luckily, acute limb ischemia has a convenient mnemonic for remembering the symptoms, the six Ps. Pain, even at rest, pallor, pulselessness, paralysis, poikilothermia, and paresthesia. While the first four are pretty self-explanatory, poikilothermia is just a fancy schmancy, oh, look at me, I read books and do my own taxes, term that means inability to regulate body temperature. Specifically in this case, we're talking about hypothermia from lack of blood flow. Paresthesia refers to neurosymptoms, including tingling, numbness, or burning. They're all embodied by the leg trapped in ice. I mean, that's gotta be painful. Definitely some pallor under there. Paralysis? Check. And poikilothermia? Uh, looks a bit nippy to me. To top it off, paresthesias are represented by her malfunctioning electronic fitness tracker. Acute limb ischemia is an emergency. Without quick action, the ischemic limb can quickly turn necrotic and gangrenous, ultimately leaving amputation as the only option. It's usually treated with a combination of anticoagulation and endovascular intervention to remove the clog in the pipe. PAD is often diagnosed by comparing the blood pressure in the upper extremities to the same measurements in the lower extremities. To do this, blood pressure is taken at both ankles and in both arms. And in this scene, it's represented by four sweatbands, two on the arms and two on the legs. The systolic blood pressure in both ankles is then divided by the systolic pressure in the arm, giving you the ankle brachial index. A normal index is around 1.2 due to the effect of gravity on the column of blood in the artery, increasing the blood pressure in the lower extremities. Just remember that the lower it is, the worse it is. Any measurement less than 0.9 is consistent with PAD, and values below 0.5 indicate severe PAD with impending limb ischemia possible. The long-term outcome can vary significantly. As we mentioned before, 
One of the worst things about peripheral artery disease is that it's often just a visible manifestation of a more dangerous but less apparent condition, such as coronary artery and cerebrovascular disease. Half of patients with PAD have concomitant disease of their coronary, carotid, or cerebral arteries, and 20% of patients will have a stroke or heart attack within five years of their PAD diagnosis. Treatment of PAD is similar to treatment of other atherosclerotic diseases. Remove the risk factors, treat current disease, and prevent clot formation. So take care of those risk factors. That means counseling about smoking cessation, therapies to treat hyperlipidemia, glucose control in diabetics, and normalization of blood pressure and hypertension. Similar to what you might do in coronary or cerebrovascular disease, antiplatelet therapy with aspirin is usually indicated in combination with celostazole a phosphodiesterase inhibitor that helps reduce the symptoms of peripheral artery disease. Check out our Sketchy Farm antiplatelet sketch for more info on the aspirin umpire and celostazole lost and found. If medications aren't enough, bypass surgery, yep, they're not just reserved for coronary artery disease, is a common tactic used to perfuse the affected extremities. Finally, if all else fails and limb gangrene is inevitable or already happening, Amputation of the affected toes, feet, or even the entire lower leg is the last line of defense. All right, I know you're tired, but keep it moving! Remember that hypertension I was talking about? We've got a whole sketch on just that to start off a whole new chapter. Let's go, let's see some hustle. You can do it, take it to the limit. Everybody to the limit. Push yourself past reason. Your will is made of carbon fiber. Uh... I was just trying to help.